the term high functioning depression. Now when we hear this term high functioning depression, it's first important to note here this is not a mental disorder. It's a term used in the popular culture to describe symptoms of depression that have a minimal effect on functioning at work, in school, or in social activities. It's analogous to an old mental disorder called dysthymia or dysthymic disorder that's not used anymore but referred to a set of depressive symptoms that were low grade and tended to last several years. The term high function depression actually comes with a number of problems and I'll get to those in a few moments. But first to better understand the construct, it's important to understand major depressive disorder and a disorder called persistent depressive disorder. There are other depressive disorders in addition to these two, but I'll be looking at these two in order to clarify this term high functioning depression. Now with major depressive disorder, we think of this as a chronic disorder, and the symptoms have to be present for at least two weeks for a diagnosis. Now there's a list of symptoms and the symptom criteria in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and here we see that five or more symptoms need to be endorsed. One of these symptoms, one of the five symptoms, must be either depressed mood or diminished interest or pleasure in activities. We see other symptoms associated with the disorder as well, including a change in weight or change in appetite, sleep disturbance, psychomotor agitation, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or inappropriate guilt, difficulty concentrating, and suicidal ideation. When these symptoms occur and some other different criteria are met, someone can have major depressive disorder and if the symptoms are active, they would be in a major depressive episode. So major depressive disorder comprises major depressive episodes, although technically somebody can have just one major depressive episode and still receive the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. So again, major depressive disorder is thought of as a chronic disorder. Now I'm going to refer to this disorder simply as MDD. And it's important to recognize here that even though it's considered chronic in many instances, you can also think of it, of course, as episodic or acute because, again, it comprises major depressive episodes. So this is an important feature of MDD, this understanding that it tends to be episodic or cyclic, that the major depressive episodes tend to come and go. Now, in comparing this disorder to persistent depressive disorder, here we see a disorder that's really dysthymic disorder and a disorder called chronic major depressive disorder. These two were combined, and in the current DSM, we see they're referred to as persistent depressive disorder. So that disorder, dysthymic disorder, as I indicated, doesn't exist anymore. Now, a persistent depressive disorder, which I'll refer to as PDD, we see that depressed mood is one of the symptoms, and the symptoms must be present for at least two years. So with MDD, two weeks. With PDD, two years. In addition to depressed mood, two or more symptoms from the symptom criteria must be met, and we see symptoms like poor appetite, sleep disturbance, fatigue, a decrease in self-esteem, difficulty concentrating, and hopelessness. We see there's a bit of overlap between the symptom criteria for PDD and MDD, but the overlap is not perfect. So we see symptoms that are possible with MDD that aren't listed in the symptom criteria for PDD like feelings of worthlessness, diminished interest or pleasure in activities, suicidal ideation, and psychomotor agitation. This distinction, these four symptoms, become important later on, and I'll describe why. So in looking at MDD versus PDD, we see a different dynamic than we saw with MDD and dysthymia. So the current dynamic, MDD and PDD, we really see acute versus chronic. Now again, I mentioned that MDD is considered a chronic disorder in most cases, but because the major depressive episodes are acute, because they come and go, we could look at MDD as an acute or episodic disorder. But PDD, because the symptoms have to be present for two years, really has a definition that's more consistent with the term chronic. We know that that's almost always going to be long-lasting, beyond just the two years that are required for the diagnosis. So it does get a little confusing because both disorders can be considered chronic, but it's important to understand how one appears more acute and one appears more chronic. This is important in terms of understanding the term high-functioning depression. Now, PDD is often conceptualized as less severe, especially if it's 
persistent depressive disorder only, or what they call with pure dysthymic syndrome. And that's because the four symptoms that MDD has that PDD does not have, but also because of the number of symptoms that need to be endorsed for a diagnosis. Again, five or more for MDD and only two or more the symptom criteria for PDD. But both disorders have mild, moderate, and severe specifiers. So if somebody had moderate or severe PDD, we would think that their functioning would be more limited than somebody who has mild MDD. So we shouldn't automatically believe that all instances, all presentations where we see PDD are going to be less severe than MDD. Now what makes these depressive disorders even more complex to understand is the idea that they can be comorbid. Somebody can have both MDD and PDD, although the way it's coded would be persistent depressive disorder and then there'd be a specifier, like with persistent major depressive episodes. So that would be if somebody had MDD for the two years or more. We also see intermittent major depressive episodes, and that can be with or without a current episode. So somebody could be diagnosed with PDD and have a major depressive episode at that same time, or they could have had it previously. So a few different <coughs> specifier options there. Also, someone can have only PDD. I mentioned that before. This is called pure dysthymic syndrome. That's the specifier. And somebody can have MDD that has symptoms for more than two years and still not qualify for a diagnosis of PDD. Now this is considered relatively uncommon, but the reason it can occur is because MDD has those four symptoms that aren't included in the definition of PDD. I mentioned that before. Now I also mentioned before that I would discuss why the term high-functioning depression can be problematic. So the issue I have with the term high-functioning depression is it does not offer clinical utility above and beyond our current classification system, which as you can see is already quite confusing. There are mild, moderate, and severe versions of both MDD and PDD, like I indicated, and really the term high-functioning depression most closely aligns with a mild presentation of either MDD or PDD. So we already have a classification that does the job. The term high-functioning depression, again, doesn't really add any value. The reason we have classifications or diagnoses in the first place is because symptoms tend to cluster together. So we see that certain symptoms tend to appear together and they appear to affect people in similar ways. We make that a classification and we use that for aiding in treatment planning, prognosis, and to understand potential outcomes. So in short, to help clients who have those symptoms. The term high-functioning depression doesn't offer any value in these areas. I also worry it has the potential to do some harm. If someone feels depressed, if they feel like they might have MDD or PDD, but they're still functioning, they might believe that they don't need treatment or their problem is not serious or it could go away on its own, which of course there's always the potential that it'll go away on its own, but we usually don't conceptualize these disorders in that way. We know they tend to be chronic. They tend to be long-lasting. Another concern I have with the term high-functioning depression is we can really apply this prefix to any mental disorder. So somebody could theoretically have high-functioning anxiety, OCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, schizophrenia, substance use disorder, or borderline personality disorder. With any of these disorders, we're going to see individuals who are high-functioning, who have a mild presentation of that disorder and are able to function well at work, school, and social activities. But that doesn't mean that each of those disorders should have a high-functioning classification. Again, what value does that term offer above and beyond what we already have? Now, the last point I'll make about high-functioning depression is we don't see this term used in the research literature. We agree on terms to facilitate communication between mental health treatment providers and also to advance our knowledge through research. And superfluous terms, terms that are unnecessary, that are extra, like high-functioning depression, can represent an obstacle when trying to achieve both this communication and research. So the term may refer to something that actually happens, but we have to ask ourselves, is it a useful way to classify that experience, or should we simply use what we already have available in the DSM 
and what's already used by mental health counselors.